and there sometimes can be this like culture of not being critical of other providers, you know, so within the community, not really wanting to, I guess, shit on other people. I don't really play that way though. I don't exactly stand by that. Like I have no problem saying in a session with somebody that I don't think they're getting appropriate care or adequate care somewhere else if they describe to me a situation that sounds problematic. Hey everybody, before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 367. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people just like you. And today I have a question and answer. I'm just doing one question, sort of. Uh, It's a longer question, and then it has sort of two sub-questions in there. So I figured it would make, you know, a good full episode. Um, But yeah, just addressing one person's inquiry. If you would like to send me a question for a future episode of the show, please send me an email to duffthepsych at gmail.com or go to duffthepsych.com and use the contact form there. I've been getting lots of really good questions lately, so I'm excited for this episode and future episodes where I get to use these cool questions. You guys uh, never cease to bring lots of variety, which is super great. And today I get to talk about something that I haven't really been able to dive into yet. So happy about that. Um, I don't have too much to talk about up front. Uh, My Etsy shop that I mentioned a few episodes ago is still going strong. I'll put a link to it in the uh, show notes at uh, dovethesite.com slash episode 367. Um, but I've been making lots of different uh, mugs and prints and things like that. A lot of you guys on social media have seen the series of potion bottles for the different psychiatric medications. So if you want to get a mug or print with a uh, kind of Halloween style potion bottle that says, say, Lamictal or Zoloft or something like that on it, uh, you can get that. <laughs> they're, they're pretty fun. People are really, really liking the designs. Um, and I've been having fun making them. I've gotten so many requests for, you know, specific medications that like this past week, I, I sat down and made like, I don't know, 16 more of them or something like that. So it's been fun. Um, and then, yeah, uh, hopefully you guys are taking care of yourselves. I have some fun stuff coming up this weekend. I'm going to a, a friend's Oktoberfest party. Uh, some of my best friends, they do a annual Oktoberfest party here in California. And it's, it's great. They've spent, you know, weeks making sausages and schnitzel and, you know, pretzels and importing beer and the whole nine yards. So it's going to be really fun. So I'm looking forward to getting on with the weekend. Um, But for now, I'm happy to be here with you. Thank you for your attention. And I will stop rambling and get into the episode. So the question I'm going to read here is a little bit on the longer side. And as I said, it has kind of multiple component questions. So I'm going to read through the whole thing and then I'll, you know, kind of go through it. So it reads, I started listening to your podcast a few months ago after a men's health article about mental health mentioned your podcast. So I thought I would give it a try. I've been a loyal listener ever since then. I'm actually reading Dr. Becca Levy's book, Breaking the Aging Code, again, based on a summary of her work in Men's Health Magazine. At the time I'm typing this, I'm in the middle of chapter five, where She, the author, describes the historic bias against helping older people with mental health problems. On page 82, she says, Doctors are quick to give older patients medications, which requires less effort and time to administer and tends to be cheaper in the short term than combining them with psychotherapy, although many patients would prefer also including meeting with the therapist in their treatment. And then on page 83, it says, 64% of mental health providers do not accept older patients who rely on Medicare. I find this deeply troubling and discriminatory. As a man in my late 50s, I want to make sure that I get the appropriate care that I will need in the future. I never had children, so I don't have a family advocate that others have. I have two questions based on this. One, what should I consider for my own well-being as I get older? 
I do exercise, which includes running twice per week, weightlifting twice per week, and yoga once per week, and running anywhere from one to three obstacle courses, obstacle course races each year. Hopefully this helps my mental as well as physical health, but is there anything beyond this and a healthy diet I should be thinking of? And two, what can be done to help the medical community improve their practices for the aging population as a whole? I don't want to be dismissed as an old person set in his ways the way Levy talks about in her book. Thank you for considering these questions. So thank you for that. Uh, a lot of good stuff in here, um, and it's a good set of questions. And I appreciate you checking out the podcast based on that Men's Health article. That's why I do that stuff, you know, and the off chance that somebody does see the resource and then checks it out and finds other information that's more applicable to them in particular. And here we are answering your question. So I appreciate you. Uh, there's a lot of things that you wrote in the kind of comments here that I want to just riff on a little bit in addition to addressing your specific questions. And just a quick bit of context for anybody who may be new that's listening. Um, I do a lot of different stuff within the field of psychology. And my day job that I you know, am doing several times a week is what's called neuropsychology. And in this role, primarily what I do is I do assessments of people and their cognitive functioning, cognitive meaning thinking skills like memory and such. So this is sometimes for people that have had a brain injury or a stroke or some, you know, congenital issue that they that they have with their brain. But many times it's for older adults who are wondering if they're developing dementia or their families think they are, but they don't, different things like that. So therefore, I have a ton of exposure to the issues that you're talking about here. And then I also, in my own kind of private therapy practice, see a number of older adults that are on Medicare in my therapy practice, just as routine clients that I see, you know, from week to week. So I get to hear even more about the firsthand experience, not just with me, but in them dealing with other doctors and such. Now, the book you're reading, um, I haven't read it, but from what you wrote, Dr. Levy sounds like uh, she's right on the mark that there's a ton of age bias in medicine. It's really frustrating and it's horrible. The, The deeper you get into it, the more tuned in you are, the more you can see it. And, you know, for me, one of the main ways that I see age discrimination or bias in medicine is the lack of like diagnostics, the lack of follow-up care that older adults get. Uh, This can be, you know, just not digging into something enough or blowing off an issue as something that, well, it is what it is. They don't need to go any further than that. So for example, um, I see a lot of people who have uh, come in for an assessment after they've had a stroke. And so when I get them in my office, it's after they've returned from the hospital and now they're looking into whatever cognitive or sometimes behavioral or other issues that they have in the wake of their incident. And so I'll ask them about, you know, okay, well, so you were in the hospital. What happened after that? Or what sort of treatment did you get? Have you had speech therapy? You know, are they doing physical therapy? Have you been told what you should be working on right now? And it's shocking how often people get absolutely no follow-up care or guidance about how they should be recovering from their stroke, what they should do, what they should be looking out for. And I see this as like definitely getting worse as the person is older, right? So somebody who's in their fifties and has a stroke, they will probably get a good amount of follow-up care. People are very invested in them recovering from this, but somebody in their eighties, late eighties, even they often are just sent home. You know, they're like, Oh yeah, it looks like it was a stroke. Um, you're stable now go home and like nothing from there. So yeah, it it can be very, very frustrating because why do those people deserve any less care? You know, I think the assumption there is like, well, they're old (laughs) and yeah, I also see doctors and various, you know, kind of providers within the mental health sphere put in an infuriating lack of effort for older adults at times. Um, I recently saw somebody I'm talking about, like, I think it was this week or last week. I saw somebody for assessment and it was for their, their cognitive issues, especially memory. And it's something where this person, according to not just them, but according to their family or caregivers, whoever was with them, didn't have any real significant issues beyond what you would just expect for somebody's age up until a few months ago when they had a sudden decline in functioning and started showing odd behavior. Rather than look into it, though, they they saw their primary care doctor and their doctor was just like, "Mm, it looks like they probably have dementia. She's old. So, yeah, it's probably just dementia and sent them on their way. 
if you could see me right now, my I'm gesticulating. My hands are flying in the air. That's not how it fucking works. <laughs> okay, that's not how it works. Um, I'll, I'll get into a little bit of psychobabble here and talk about kind of the the details. But let me remind you of what the term dementia even means. Dementia is when somebody has cognitive impairment, so trouble with memory or trouble with language or trouble with their processing that's severe enough that it now impacts their functional abilities in daily life. So for example, if somebody with dementia is unable to remember to feed themselves appropriately or letting their food expire and making it dangerous for them, if they drive but they get lost and they get into um, dangerous situations with that, um, if they are unable to pay their rent because they can't remember how to write checks or forget to or think they already did, things of that sort. That's when you would consider somebody to have dementia rather than normal functioning or even mild impairment. So, you know, that's kind of the umbrella. And then generally speaking, there are two broad categories for dementia conditions. Uh, some conditions are considered progressive and some are not progressive or non-progressive. Progressive conditions are kind of what it sounds like, right? They progress over time. So these are the ones that are typically degenerative in nature. The brain actually breaks down bit by bit in some sort of way over time. So the most common example of this would be Alzheimer's disease. And then, of course, there are other diseases like Parkinson's disease or Lewy body disease that also have a progression that are involved with them. But, you know, somebody with Alzheimer's would start off with just very mild symptoms, like kind of senior moments, little bits of forgetfulness. And then they progress over time, you know, over the years until they get to the point where they have severe impairment and are basically completely dependent on other people. So with progressive conditions and these degenerative conditions like Alzheimer's, there's honestly less that we can do about it. Unfortunately, we don't have an effective treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so when we see that somebody has Alzheimer's, I still think it's very important not to write them off entirely, but also, you know, recognize that there's not as much that you can do aside from ensuring safety, planning for the future, and really working with the family to ensure those things. Um, but that's not what we're talking about here, right? We're not talking about a very gradual buildup over time. We're talking about somebody that was okay and then had a sudden onset of symptoms and impairment. And that's not typical. That means that something happened. That means there was some sort of event or some sort of illness, anything. There's so many different issues that could cause this, but there's no way that the doctor in question should have just assumed like, mm, they're getting old, they have dementia, it's fine, right? That's total bullshit. Um, I want to talk more about this and I will. Uh, first, let me take a quick break and talk about today's sponsor. All right, today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Uh, are you one of those people that, you know, do okay at night? You know, you get through your evening routine, you relax, you watch a little bit of Netflix, you have your tea or glass of wine or whatever, and you're like, oh man, I'm super tired. And then you hop into bed and your brain's like, ha, no, we're going to think about everything all at once and you're not going to sleep. <laughs> um, I can be that way sometimes, especially when I'm not feeling super good in the first place or I'm sick or vulnerable in some way. My mind likes to run rampant when I'm in bed. And it turns out that one of the best things you can do to make those thoughts be less present and less just sticky when you're trying to sleep or relax in any sort of way is to talk them out. Journaling's great, but it's also awesome to work with somebody like a therapist that can give you a safe space to do that, to get out your thoughts, especially the negative ones, and find some mental and emotional peace. So that's why I'm happy to have BetterHelp back as a sponsor. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and totally suited to your set schedule. All you do is fill out a brief questionnaire, and that will get you matched with a licensed therapist. And if you need to, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So take a break from your thoughts with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Duff today and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Duff. Okay, so I was talking about how there are many different things that can cause that sudden impairment, but that it's worth looking into because the patient that I'm talking about could have had, say, a urinary tract infection. A lot of older adults don't realize this because their doctors never talk about it, but UTIs in older adults can cause what we call delirium, which is a temporary state, right? So you have delirium that leads to confusion, sometimes agitation or strange delusional beliefs. Uh, it can cause memory problems, communication problems, all sorts of things, but it's temporary because there's an infection in the body and an infection that requires treatment. 
or the person could have had a stroke, as we've talked about here. There could have been a severe vitamin deficiency or a medication interaction that, that that's causing the issues. So many different things. Some of those are quite treatable. Some of them, you know, less so a stroke, you can recover from it, but there's nothing that, you know, is like the obvious thing to just change immediately. But if there's a vitamin deficiency or an infection of some kind that can be treated, yeah, we want to know that. But no, in this case, they're old, they're getting dementia, just let them be, which, yeah, as you can see, pisses me off. Obviously, it's a point of personal frustration, so I'm glad that you wrote in. Another thing to address in your question here is the quote from the book that you mentioned where uh, Dr. Levy mentions that doctors are very quick to give older adults psychiatric medication rather than suggesting therapy. And I think there's a few things to this. Uh, clearly, age discrimination can be a part of it. Just trying to make the case an easy one with a simple solution. Let me throw some pills at them, send them on their way. And that can happen. I think also, though, this is sometimes facilitated by the fact that many older adults were raised in a culture in which you kind of just don't question authority figures or people that you perceive as authority figures like doctors or, you know, teachers, what have you, um, because you just try to trust that they know their stuff and that they're acting in your best interest. So you believe whatever the doc says, and just going to follow along. Um, but there are some situations where I would support the idea of going straight to medication rather than therapy. I don't think that's what she's talking about in her book, though. So first, like, for instance, in the case of people who have dementia, that uh, impacts their memory or their communication abilities. So somebody who has Alzheimer's disease that's also feeling quite depressed, but they're unable to remember information from day to day, they would not be a good candidate for therapy because nothing would get done. They wouldn't be able to get anything out of it because they wouldn't remember what's happening from session to session. Same goes for people who have really serious aphasia, which is what you call communication problems, and they just can't effectively communicate. So in those cases, I much more lean toward, you know, saying, yeah, medication would be helpful here. Let's not torture them or expect more out of therapy than it would be able to deliver. Um, but, you know, there are also things like generational issues or regional beliefs regarding therapy. For some people, therapy is just something that they would never consider because they were brought up in a way that made them feel like it's just complaining and that they should keep their issues within the family or private entirely. Um, what Dr. Levy is saying is that many patients would prefer to also have therapy, though. So what I would guess is that some providers, especially ones that are also on the older side, they just assume that because their patient is not young, that they wouldn't be interested in anything other than medication. So they may even think that they're doing what the patient wants, but they also aren't asking, which is a problem. So I think that some of this is natural bias that can be hard to check yourself on at times. Uh, for me, I, I've, I've noticed in working with older adults that I will rarely ask an older person, say, for their pronouns, because I just have this assumption that people of their generation tend to stick with the binary and tend to present in a way that's, you know, quote, consistent with their gender. So I don't ask that often. And I catch myself with that. And I'm like, you know, I feel torn about it a lot of times because, you know, in a lot of times when I think to people are like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, I'm like, fuck, okay. Uh, never mind. You know, we don't need to talk about it. So yeah, sometimes there is that sort of natural bias that can be hard to check yourself on at times. But regardless of the reasoning for these situations that we're talking about with older adults, it's not fair to the patient to put assumptions about them in the way of their care. And I think that we could all benefit from asking more and assuming less in medicine. You also mentioned that the book talks about uh, how the majority of mental health providers do not take Medicare. And I want to clarify what that means for anybody that's not familiar or that doesn't live in the U.S. Medicare is what we call the government-funded insurance program, health insurance, in the U.S. This is typically for people over age 65, but it can also cover people who are younger if they're disabled or have certain medical conditions. I'm a Medicare provider. That's where the bulk of my uh, neuropsych testing cases come from is, is through Medicare. And then I also, as I mentioned earlier, have a few Medicare patients that I see for therapy. And these are all older adults. And I'll be totally honest about this. The reimbursement for Medicare is, is shit. It's really bad. <laughs> you know, there's some great aspects of it that the people who are using it can get care that you don't need to get prior authorization for the most part. You can just bill directly, but the amount that they pay is pretty laughable in comparison to most psychologists' private pay hourly rates. 
So I'll get into it more specifically. For therapy, uh, Medicare reimburses just over $80 per session. And um, sometimes that can go up if the person has co-insurance or secondary insurance, but that's usually just over like 100 And that might seem like a lot, you know, 80 to 100 per hour if you don't have sort of a high hourly rate at your job. But it, it's not as big as it sounds because you need to keep in mind there are just like outrageous overheads that go into being a psychologist. And there's also a lot of uncompensated time that you have to spend, much like a teacher, where you're doing a lot of things that you're not getting paid for. So truly, you know, if you're if you're you know looking at it compared to what a reasonable rate for a psychologist would be, that's like $150 less than I should be getting per session, <laughs> you know, really. Um, so I, I don't mind. Like I enjoy taking on some Medicare cases um, because they can be great people to work with. And people on Medicare deserve to get help, but there's no way that I would make a living just seeing Medicare cases. That would be very, very difficult. So some of this is personal and some of this is systemic. It's it's really unfortunate that Medicare doesn't reimburse better. It's great that they provide care to so many people, but it's it's hard on the provider side to make a living just taking Medicare, Medicare cases. Um, I agree that it's discriminatory, but I hope that you can also recognize there is some complexity to the issue. And in my opinion, if you're working with older adults, you are obligated to give them the same standard of care that you would give anybody else, regardless of what their you know, insurance or financial situation is. But if you decide to not see people on Medicare because it's hard to make a living, I can understand that. I just wish they reimbursed more because I would take more Medicare patients if I could. So those are kind of my general feelings about these issues. Um, let me actually address the questions that you posed here because they were good ones. In your first question, you asked, is there anything that you should be doing more of in regards to your health and longevity? And I'll say it sounds like you're already doing a ton right. You know, the physical exercise in particular is great. Cardiovascular health plays a huge factor in aging, especially when it comes to the brain. One of the biggest sources of cognitive change in older adults comes from what we call cerebrovascular disease which if you put that together, cerebro meaning brain, vascular meaning blood vessels. So this is change in blood vessels in the brain. If you go on Google and you look up, uh, if you just type in map of blood vessels in the brain, you can see a bunch of images that show there are tons of blood vessels in your brain. And in particular, in the what we call subcortical region, which is like the middle part of the brain underneath the wrinkly cortex on top, in that middle part of the brain, this is where all the nerve pathways and interconnections are between the different parts of your brain. That is packed full of blood vessels, a lot of blood vessels in there. And so as you age, and this is for everybody, as you age, the blood vessels in your body, they become less elastic, they're less stretchy, and they tend to break more easily. And that's why for a lot of older adults, you see increased bruising. You know, if they bump into the wall or a table, you get bigger bruises than you would otherwise if you were younger. And this is even more so for people that are on, say, blood thinners or something like that. But this also happens in the brain. Your body is one unit. The whole thing is one unit. And so whatever is happening you know, to your skin is probably also happening in your brain. And if you look at an MRI scan of the brain for somebody that's aging, you can see these little white spots that pop up. And these are areas of broken or blocked blood vessels. And what they call this, there's a lot of names for it. They call it white matter disease or small vessel ischemic disease. Um, microvascular disease, meaning really small, you know, uh, vasculature, lots of scary terms for it, but it all basically means the same thing. And on their own, these little spots that pop up on the MRI, these little white spots, they're not very significant, but as they add up and accumulate over time, they can start to slow down the functioning of your brain. One of the ways that I describe it to patients of mine is that it's sort of like, okay, the middle part of your brain is sort of the super highway and these are traffic jams caused by sort of like floods or, you know, uh, lanes being closed. So they can add up and they can slow down how quickly your brain works. And this happens to everybody. This is a normal par part of aging. But for some people that have more extensive white matter disease for a variety of issues, it can cause impairment beyond what we would normally expect. And again, this is usually in efficiency. It means that like you start to think more slowly. It can feel like there's like molasses in your brain. Like there's, you know, a word you're looking for or you're trying to uh, remember information about something and it's there, but it just, it just doesn't come to the surface very quickly. And you start having to kind of run through the alphabet to remember somebody's name or doing a lot of gestures. Like, can you hand me the, um, you know, the, uh, God, the, the stapler, right? And so 
you know, it, it can slow things down. And some of that is normal, but for some people it's accelerated and you have more of that than you would expect. So for the vascular health of your brain, the best thing that you can do is try to prevent damage in the first place. And so for you, it sounds like you're doing a really good job of exercising frequently. Um, other things would be managing any cardiovascular risk factors. So things that maybe come from genetics in your family or, you know, exposure to things from your past, like chemicals, etc. And then, of course, diet, as you mentioned. Uh, at the moment, the Mediterranean diet, or like a modified Mediterranean diet, is still the forerunner in terms of promoting brain health in most people. But of course, talk to your doctor if you have any specific concerns about diet, because everybody's different. Now, aside from the physical health interventions, there are a few other factors to consider when it comes to healthy brain aging. Um, what you do with your brain in terms of stimulation is also really important to maintain the health of your brain and, and good cognitive abilities. Many people will go toward things like Sudoku or crossword puzzles or word searches, and these are great, but these activities are not necessarily better than any other ones. Um, what the current research actually says is that the best thing you can do for your aging brain is to continue learning new skills. And this could be anything from learning a second language to playing an instrument to some sort of craft to ballroom dance to woodworking, literally anything that involves, you know, a skill. And this is really healthy for your brain because it kind of forces your brain to forge new connections. As you get older, your brain slows down in what's called neurogenesis, meaning making of new neurons, new, new um, you know, nerve cells in your brain. And that happens as you age, but what you have can always be connected in new ways. You can always find new pathways and building skills is a very healthy way to do that. Overall, what you want to do is try to adopt a use it or lose it approach when it comes to your brain. Um, but these things seem to be the best types of activities, ones that involve building a skill. And you don't have to ace it. You don't have to get really good at it, but you know, challenging your brain is the important part. Uh, aside from that, social interaction and social activity is also something that's that's definitely associated with positive brain aging. If you're an introverted person or averse to socializing for some sort of reason, it doesn't have to be large groups, it doesn't have to be a huge dinner with 15 people, but maintaining frequent social interaction with even just a few people is something that is extremely beneficial, and it does seem to be associated with you know healthier brain aging and better cognitive skills as you get older. Um, the other thing for you in particular that I would have you take a look at would just be your stress level. It seems like you're a very proactive person since you've been doing so much research. You exercise more than most people. You do these obstacle course races. You're, you know, writing into a podcast like this. Um, there's nothing wrong with any of that, right? It's great to be proactive. It's awesome that you're taking care of yourself. But I would also just want to ask and, you know, wonder if you're putting a ton of pressure on yourself. And if you're the type of person to try to take on too much at once, which would cause stress instead of just making you feel better. So in other words, you know, in your efforts to promote your own longevity, let's make sure that you aren't actually just slowly killing yourself with stress over the process. So those are some things to think about. You know, I think probably most of that you've known already, but in terms of promoting longevity, aside from, you know, groundbreaking research that might be coming out on a week to week basis, those are the simple things and we stick by them, they're effective, and that's those are the things you have the most control over. Now, let's address your second question, which is what can be done within the medical community to improve practices for the aging population and, and what you can do to avoid falling into these traps you're talking about. For me as a provider, one of the things that I try to do is simply give really good care to people that are older because that models for them as the patient an example of what they can expect or what they should expect from their other providers. So, you know, people are often very impressed. They're like, wow, you really are able to spend a lot of time with us. Um, you know, like let's say the psychiatrist or neurologist or primary care doctor is in and out and, you know, they have somebody typing on a computer next to them or they don't even look at them when they're talking. And so actually spending an hour going through the history and talking with them and, and hearing them out and reflecting things back to them, they're like, wow, that's really helpful. Thank you for that. And, you know, so modeling that hopefully helps them improve their standard of, of what they can expect. Um, and there sometimes can be this like culture of not being critical of other providers, you know, so within the community, not really wanting to, I guess, shit on other people. I don't really play that way, though. I don't exactly stand by that. Like, I have no problem 
saying in a session with somebody that I don't think they're getting appropriate care, or adequate care somewhere else, if they describe to me a situation that sounds problematic, right? So like that, the situation I talked about earlier in this answer where the person had a sudden decline and their doctor just basically sent them home, I was like, oh, no, I, I think that you're probably not getting the, uh, a good standard of care with, with that provider that would not really be appropriate in my uh, opinion. So, you know, in situations like that, I'll encourage people to get second, second opinions or push harder for a given topic with their providers if necessary. Um, I've even gone as far as to like, you know, I saw somebody uh, last week, I think, where their family, I, it, I just happened to see them on the day that their family member was there and they were going to their primary care doctor right after. And I was like, here, let me hand write you a note to take with you to the doctor to look into certain things. Like, this is what I think should be looked into. So, you know, I'm not afraid to mix it up a little bit in that regard. And so that's how I kind of take a little bit of personal responsibility for this type of issue. Um, for individuals like yourself on the, on the patient side, I think one of the most important things that you can do is also to make sure that you're doing your research and to push back on providers if you don't think that you're getting fully appropriate care and to advocate for yourself. Of course, I'm not telling you to be blindly critical or mean to your providers or, you know, kind of boss them around. But if you feel like they're not looking as deeply into something as you would like them to, feel free to push back and ask that they do a bit more. And if they're not willing to, go get a second opinion. Uh, what could this look like in practice, right? So let's say that you um, you wanted to get a brain scan, like an MRI, because you're concerned about uh, cognitive changes that you're experiencing. And the doctor says, oh, you're still young. You don't need to worry about that yet. You could say something to the effect of, I understand, uh, but I have noticed changes and I've been concerned. And I'd like to at least establish a baseline so that future scans can be, a, you know, compared to this. It could be a point of comparison. Is this something that you would be willing to help me out with? And I think that would be a good way to, you know, kind of push back in a way that's still respectful, but saying, hey, no, like, let's look into this a bit. There are certainly insurance issues that can come up where, you know, insurance may not want to cover a certain procedure at a given age. But even with that, I would just push your doctor to be frank with you. Be like, is this an insurance thing? Is that why you don't want to do this? Like, is what's the reasoning here? Ask them to kind of explain a bit and ask them to be honest if there's anything like that. And if that's the case, maybe you could work it out. Maybe you could talk to your insurance company or maybe you can ask them to advocate on your behalf. Lots of different situations that could potentially happen here. Um, I would also encourage anybody, but especially people that are, you know, 50 and older, to be careful about sticking with one provider for a very, very long time, simply because you always have and they're comfortable. Sometimes you can find a really good doctor and there's no reason that you should switch from them. But there are other times where people stick with the doctor for way too long, just because it's what they've always done. And they end up getting subpar care because maybe the doctor is not just up to snuff for doctors these days or sometimes when you work with somebody for a very long time you kind of get blind spots they've just known you forever and they don't really see things the way that a fresher doctor would a lot of feedback that i've gotten from my older patients recently has been that they're benefiting from getting younger doctors who seem to be less stuck in their ways and less jaded about the field this is obviously a generalization but it's something to consider you know not all medical providers are created equal and if you don't go to get a good feeling from a medical provider that you have, you're well within your rights to look elsewhere. Uh, one other sticking point for a lot of older adults is that they tend to be more private about their medical and mental health. And that's understandable. We've talked about this generationally. You know, it's not always appropriate or it wasn't always appropriate to discuss things of a personal nature. But I would say that, you know, being a little bit more open can be helpful, especially with family and close friends, because if you keep things from them, you might be missing things that others would pick up on, you know, from a more detached third person perspective that you may not be able to see. So I would encourage you and others to just, you know, run things by people, the care that you're getting, the treatments that you're getting, things your doctors have said. You can always bring in a loved one with you to an appointment if you need, but, you know, running this by people that you trust that are close to you, and then you can consider any opinions that they have and balance those with what you feel and what you know already. Lastly, if you have, you know, very serious concerns about the way a doctor may be discriminating based on age or just trying to take an easy route for treatment, don't be afraid to speak up. You know, aside from addressing things directly with the doctor, you can also make a complaint. If they're in a healthcare network or a larger clinic, you can make a complaint to the clinic director. 
You could write a review on Yelp or a similar website so that other people know. Uh, you could even make a complaint to their licensing board if it's really that serious. So there are options there. But overall, I think that you are on a very good path. I would ask to just make sure that you're finding a good balance in your life, not letting the stress about aging paradoxically cause you to age more quickly. And I think you'll be in great shape. Um, and if you find personally that you're passionate about this topic, feel free to find your own ways to make a difference as well. Like it could be that, you know, you just talk to people in your life that you encounter that are older adults and, you know, help them advocate, or you maybe even get involved if there are organizations locally or regionally that promote wellness and healthy aging, you can always get involved with those too. So thank you for the really good question. And that's the end of the episode. This has been episode 367 of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. If you want the full show notes, again, go to deathlesssite.com slash episode 367. And if you want to send in a question, send me a question to deathlesspsych at gmail.com. Have a good time this weekend and in the coming week, and I will see you for the next episode. Bye.